Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service at the Vine, the online campus of Riceville United Methodist Church. We are truly grateful to worship together this morning. Today is Palm Sunday, which is the beginning of Holy Week. So our prayer is through today's worship service, you will encounter God in a meaningful way and join us this journey towards the cross, eventually the victory of the resurrection. Now let us prepare our hearts before God. Take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord. Please join me in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be shown on your screen. Merciful God, search us and know us. In this season of Lent, grant us courage to take honest stock of ourselves and acknowledge our wrongdoings. Jesus, as we walk with you towards the cross, Take away our bent to sinning and teach us how to live. In Jesus' name, Amen. Oh 
Let us go before God in our prayer. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, thank you for giving us this holy day to come before you. Thank you for calling us to this holy place to worship you. This is the day that you have made. Help us rejoice and be glad in it. We stand for the beginning of Holy Week, the start of the journey towards the power of the cross, the victory of the resurrection. Thank you for sending your Son and paving the way for our lives to be set free through Jesus Christ. Only your ways are righteous and true. Only you are holy and just. Only your love stands firm forever but we often forget this truth. We would rather sing hosannas with a cheering crowd than stand up for our convictions in the face of an angry mob. We would rather dine with Christ at his table than stand up for him in a courtyard of accusers. We would rather see ourselves as Christ's champions than admit to ourselves that we too could betray him. Forgive our fickle faith and heal our hesitant heart. Merciful God, help us sit silently and feel the depth of your love. Our holy week is in your hands. Guide us on this journey that we may be ever faithful, ever hopeful, and ever loving. Lord, we seek your grace and comfort. We ask your peace for those enduring difficult seasons. And now we lift up in prayer those who are in need of your merciful touch. So we pray for those whom we name with our voices or hold in our heart. Lord, hear our prayers. Pour out your strength and comfort upon them. Touch their lives and souls with your warm embrace. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our hearts and gifts. As we respond to God's generosity and grace, I'd like to remind you that you can contribute to the ministry of Riceville United Methodist Church through our website and by mail. Let us continue to worship God. Hello kids, 
guys, I'm Pastor Eun Seo. I'm so excited to spend this time with you. So today is a special Sunday, which is Palm Sunday. Have you ever heard about that? So when you think about Palm Sunday, what kind of things coming, come, to, come to your mind? Palm Sunday, so palm trees and palm trees branches and or donkeys. Yes, right. So today we're going to talk about all of these things, but most importantly about Jesus Christ. So about 2000 years ago, Jesus and his disciples were traveling to the city of Jerusalem and um, the city was going to have a very, very big celebration, big party called Passover. On their way, they stopped by a one village and Jesus gave his disciples a special instructions. It was, he said, go to that village over there and you will see a young donkey tied up and untie it and bring it to me. If someone asks why, just say, the Lord needs it. So the disciples went there and found the little donkey. So just like uh, Jesus said they would. And when they started um, untying it, the owner asked, Hey, why are you taking my donkey? So the disciples said, The Lord needs it. And the owner said, Okay, you take it. So they brought the donkey to Jesus and they put their clothes on back so that Jesus could have a comfy seat. When they entered the town, the people had already heard about Jesus. Jesus was healing the sick and um, Jesus was doing very amazing things like miracles. So a big crowd gathered to see Jesus. And they threw their clothes on the road and waved palm trees and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means save us, save us right now. It was like a big parade, but people didn't understand who Jesus was. They thought he would be a king on the earth and do great things for them, such as providing good food, uh, making them rich people, and giving them good fame. But Jesus was not kind of that king. So just a few days later, these same people who had a church for him would be shouting, crucify him, hang him on the cross. So from today and for this coming week, we are remembering Jesus's journey from the cross to suffering to his death. But here is the good news. Jesus would rise again so Jesus is our Savior and Jesus is our Lord. So today we are here to praise Jesus and we shout Hosanna. So when we shout Hosanna, let us remember that Jesus save us. You are our Savior. You are our Lord. Let us ask this to Jesus in our prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for saving us. Help us remember your love. In Jesus' name, Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy and privilege to get to bring you our message today. Our scripture passage comes from the gospel according to John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. 
But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Would you pray with me now? Lord, we, your people, are longing today to hear a word from you. God, I ask that in this time you would use me to speak to your people. Lord, if there is anything that I say that is not from you, please let it be instantly forgotten. But God, anything I say that is from you, let it sink and root deeply into our hearts. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I will never forget the magic of reading Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet for the first time. I was a freshman in high school, and I thought that my English teacher was the coolest woman in the entire world. Seriously, my best friend and I used to spend our sleepovers trying to replicate Miss Mill's signature look, shimmery lavender eyeshadow. It never worked on us. She had a million ways to make a story come alive for us. But the one that sticks with me most is this. After we finished reading the play, she had us go back through and try to find the moment when it all went wrong. When was the point of no return? When was it that the die was cast, that this young love was destined to end in tragedy? I remember sitting in one of those slippery metal chair and desk combos, combing through the play, trying to figure it out. Was it when Romeo arrived at the crypt too early? Was it when Friar Lawrence's message wasn't delivered? Was it the death of Mercutio and Tybalt? None of these moments seemed right. I kept turning pages backward, going earlier and earlier in the story. Finally, I came to the conclusion that the moment their fates were sealed was the moment Romeo and Juliet locked eyes at the ball. It was that moment when they fell in love instantly that the tragedy began. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, character is destiny. It is who we are that ultimately determines our fate. And in the best tragedy, it's these fatal flaws of the characters that bring about their downfall, not their outside circumstances. Something about this idea was fascinating to me. And since that first read of Romeo and Juliet, I have continued to be fascinated by tragic plays, books, and movies. Maybe that's why I find the story that we've read today the story of Jesus's entry into Jerusalem to be so compelling. Jesus's death too is a tragedy. If the gospel was a play, Jesus's entry into Jerusalem would be the first scene in the final act. Imagine, if you will, our stage. The curtains open and entering from stage right is Jesus riding on a stallion. No, that's not right riding on a donkey. Have you seen a donkey recently? You'll notice that they're really not very big. Now, I'm pretty short, but I wonder if my feet might still actually drag on the ground if I were trying to ride one of them. A donkey is a strange method of transportation for a full-grown man, especially one who's been welcomed as a king. And that is exactly what the crowd's doing. They're lining the streets, cheering, waving palm branches. This was something that the people probably would have done before. The Romans called it a triumph. When Caesar won a great battle, he would ride into town on a war horse or in a chariot, along with a whole procession that included the spoils of war, treasure taken from conquered people, along with slaves who were captured. Everyone would line the streets, cheer, and wave branches. When Jesus rides into Jerusalem, the people treat him as a king who has won a major victory. 
Jesus is riding on a donkey and not a horse because he's not the type of king that Caesar is. He isn't about military might and political power. He's signaling his humility, but at the same time, he's also pointing to his true identity. He is something much greater than Caesar. He is the promised king of Israel, the Messiah. As Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, he embodies a well-known prophecy about the Messiah that comes from the prophet Zechariah. Do not fear, daughter Zion, for behold, your king comes to you riding on a donkey. If this were a play, you might be thinking that everything's going to be okay after all. The people are on Jesus' side. They're cheering for him and calling him the king of Israel. But in the background, the religious leaders and government officials are not smiling. And as readers who know the story already, we see the irony that the crowd that is shouting Hosanna on Sunday will be shouting crucify him by Friday. I often find myself reading the gospels, believing that if I had been there, it would have been different. That's the magic of reading a tragedy, isn't it? We can put ourselves in the story and see how we could have made a different choice and kept that next domino from falling. When those crowds yelled, crucify him, I make believe that I would have stood up and defended Jesus. When Judas agrees to betray Jesus for 30 silver coins, I think about how I would have told those Pharisees to get lost. When Peter claims that he never even met Jesus, I picture myself refusing to leave Jesus' side, confidently proclaiming my allegiance. But in my heart of hearts, I know I wouldn't have done any better. Character is destiny. Maybe, like in Romeo and Juliet, the moment it all goes wrong is actually much further back than we thought. Perhaps Jesus' death was determined not in the last week of his life, but in the Garden of Eden. We've spent the season of Lent getting honest about how we have strayed from what God wants for us. We were created to be in relationship with God, but instead we decided we wanted to be God. God gave us a beautiful world and told us to take care of it, but we abused the earth for our own gain. God gave us the gift of meaningful work, but we turned our work into an idol. God created us to be in relationship with each other, but instead of treating each other as equals, we started using people for our own gain. These are universal problems, and they run deep. At their core, all of these distortions have one common thread. It is the whisper of the serpent in the garden, saying, do you really believe that you can trust God? Since that moment in the garden, we all have had that seed of doubt planted in us. Did God really say that? God's holding out on you. God just doesn't want you to be as powerful as he is, so he's hoarding all the power that you could have. This is the idea that the serpent has put in our heads. You cannot trust God. In one way or another, it's this very lie that leads to Jesus' execution. The Pharisees and the other religious leaders have become obsessed with certainty. They, and they alone, have the answers about what is true and what is not. They alone know what is biblical. They traded honest dependence on God for their own certainty. And so they couldn't recognize Jesus for who he was because he didn't fit into their certain paradigm of Messiah. And when they see someone who is threatening their religious power, they take matters into their own hands. They plot to have Jesus killed. The Roman government officials have never had any interest in trusting God. Why trust in God when you can have anything you want if your army is strong enough? 
Even the Roman religion wasn't built on trust or relationship, but on making sacrifices to the right gods to get you what you want. For Judas, Peter, and the other disciples, their lack of trust in God feels more disheartening. Even after three years of walking with Jesus, Judas still chooses to betray him for the equivalent of a few thousand dollars. We can only guess what his motivation was. Maybe he was motivated by the money. Maybe it was something else, some ideological difference with Jesus. The other disciples aren't much better. As soon as Jesus is arrested, they scatter. Maybe it's because they stopped believing that God is on Jesus' side. That if Jesus was really the Messiah, he wouldn't have been arrested at all, especially by the religious leaders that they had spent their lives trusting. Maybe it was because they didn't trust God to keep them safe, so they decided to protect themselves. You can't trust God. A lie so potent it has changed the course of all our lives. A lie that leads to the greatest tragedy imaginable, when the Son of God was killed by the very ones he came to save. Jesus' death is a tragedy. And it is tragic all the more because we are still a part of it today. I know that if I had been the one in the garden, I would have taken the fruit too. And I know that if I had been in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, it would have been my voice in that crowd yelling, crucify, crucify. When we face the tragedy head on, we see that although we have always had free will, the story was never going to go another way because character is destiny. And our character has been changed by that serpent's lie. If we were the ones holding the pen, this would be it. Our ultimate rejection of God would be the moment when the curtains close. But God was writing a bigger story. We might have thought that this was our story, but it was God's from the very beginning. And God was telling a story that says that God's love will never stop finding a way to get to us. That God can use even our rebellion to set us free. That God can use our very lack of faith to affirm God's promises. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look. Your king is coming. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that when our love failed and we turned away, your love remained steadfast. God, as we enter now into this holy week, we ask that you would keep us close by your side hearing your offer of redemption, even as we experience our own brokenness. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Each week during Lent, we have been giving you some sort of invitation to take into your next week to draw closer to God. This week, our invitation is simple, but perhaps also challenging. It's simply this, resist the temptation to skip to Easter. Be willing to go through this Holy Week and face the reality of the cross. We have several ways that you can remember Holy Week this week here at Wrightsville. The first is our Maundy Thursday service, which will be here in the sanctuary at seven o'clock on Thursday, and will also be streamed live on Facebook if you're unable to join us in person or would prefer to view from home. Also on Friday, you can join us for a time of personal guided prayer anytime between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. at our new extension campus, Wrightsville on Oleander. If you are looking for an at-home option on Friday, we'll also have a digital Stations of the Cross that will be available here on YouTube. 
If none of these options work for you, I'd invite you to spend some time in scripture reading and prayer, thanking Jesus for the sacrifice that he made for us all on the cross. As you go now from this time, may the spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ our Lord, go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace.